Hey, it's Kyle here, and welcome back to Korea Strategia in Kerbal Space Program, where I plan to do a complete playthrough of KSP, hopefully before KSP 2 drops in February 2023. This time, we're starting off in Mission Control, as last time we completed all of our original goals of getting to space. So I've picked up the obligatory Orbit Kerbin contract, along with picking up a contract to put a comm satellite in the orbit of the Mun. A optimistic offer, considering we've yet to reach orbit. We've also upgraded our launch platform and Mission Control to level 2, and it's time to buy some new parts for that lovely science Val brought back in the last video. Basic science is a must, the battery pack and antennas are going to come in very handy, general rocketry because more boosters, and stability for the decouplers, because this means we can build a bigger rocket. So now it's time to head into the VAB to build what will be known as Plunk 3. And the first thing we're going to do is make it bigger and better and more controllable. So that means we're going to put a couple of boosters on it, and you'll probably also notice that we're filling it chock full of science equipment as well. Because let's be honest, that's kind of our big aim at the moment, and that's to unlock more parts, along with the money of course. You might have also noticed I'm putting a lot of parachutes on each stage, and that's because we're going to try and recover as much money as possible from our launches. This is career mode, after all. Part of that means I'm using a great mod called Stage Recovery. Stage Recovery allows drop stages to be recovered automatically as long as they have enough parachutes attached or enough fuel and resources to land themselves if they have a probe core. This helps offset the massive amount of space tourism and needless satellite deployment missions that you typically have to deal with as part of career mode to make money. As always, mod is in the description for those who want to read up on it and it supports installation using the CCAN mod manager. Also, it's just good practice to not leave a lot of space debris around and it's something we'll be keeping in mind in this playthrough. And with that, it's time to head over to the launch pad, and our pilot today is Jeb. And there was an incident at the launch complex yesterday, as it turns out. He desperately wanted to be the first Kerbal in space. KSC Security apparently reported an incident at Mission Control shortly before Val's launch. So it seems it was diffused by informing Jeb he's been selected to command the primary crew for the MUN mission, so hopefully that's the last we hear of that. To get into a low orbit around Kerbin, you need about 3,400 meters a second of delta V. I'd recommend aiming for about 4,000 to give yourself some wiggle room, but we're just a tad short of 3,600, so we should be able to get into orbit and re-enter with a little bit to spare. So far, it's been a pretty uneventful takeoff with... Wait, did the boosters just explode? Of course they did! Decoupling while you have that much wind pressure on the craft can be pretty dangerous, uh, especially if you're trying to recover anything. But now that our apoapsis is above 70 kilometers, I've throttled down the main engine substantially. While KSP doesn't technically have a maximum dynamic pressure or max Q event, if you find your launch is powering through a fiery missile patch like this, it might be worth backing off the throttle as you're essentially wasting your fuel against atmospheric drag. I don't know if this makes any difference in the game, but for some reason I feel like KSP2 might penalise us for doing this, so better to build those good habits now rather than a fiery death in the launch of the new game. We've just confirmed that one of our SRBs did indeed explode on its way down, so we'll wait to find out what happened to the other. We'll quickly go and collect some science data while we're up here, and as we approach the apoapsis of our flight, we'll use up what's left in our core stage, separate, and fire up our upper stage engine to begin circularizing our orbit. As we have not upgraded the KSC enough to allow for manoeuvre planning, I'm just going to keep an eye on our periapsis and our remaining fuel to ensure we can make our re-entry burn as well as getting into orbit. And with confirmation of orbit in the top right mission, we've just lowered our periapsis enough to get back into the atmosphere by the time we come around the back of Kerbin. So why not launch with more fuel? Well, because we're doing career mode, we have to upgrade the VAB and the launch pad to handle enough parts. And unfortunately at this point, we do not have enough money to do that and continue doing launches. But while we're up here, we'll complete all the science. Jeb can enjoy the view and bask in the glory in being the first Kerbal in orbit. And then I'll quickly tweak some of Planet Shine to improve the lighting conditions in orbit. Now, if you haven't used Planet Shine or heard of it, it's also a mod. What a surprise. It's a visual mod that lets planets and moons reflect their colored light onto your vessel. But its default ambient light in space is actually very dark by default, which while realistic for playthrough, doesn't make very good videos. Well, it's now time to start our re-entry, and as our fuel reserves were quite tight and we ended up with an apoapsis much higher than expected, 
we've had to opt for a semi-controlled atmospheric drag re-entry. Essentially, if you can get your periapsis 15 kilometers or more below the Kármán line of a planet, the height which defines where space starts and atmosphere ends, you can use it to slow down your orbit and force a re-entry. Our periapsis was around 45 kilometers after our last burn, and unfortunately, the re-entry didn't go particularly smoothly. This is what I get for trying to brute force my way through in career mode, and things do explode, but thankfully, we've not had any loss of life. You might notice we're seeing a lot of overheating on the body with those gorges going off, and sooner or later, something was bound to fail. Our apoapsis was too high, so our re-entry speed was a lot higher than was safe with the technology we have, and the science junior part was the point of failure, because it's honestly awful structurally, and I knew the risk when I put it on the rocket. We then also lost the magnetometer boom as well, but thankfully our parachutes remained intact, along with our cargo bay full of science. So we'll just have to settle for what we've collected this time round, and damn, that's a nice sunrise through the clouds as well. I'm monitoring the deploy options for the drogue parachutes to slow us down, as our current speed was a bit too high to safely deploy. Thankfully, that didn't end up being a problem, and we were able to safely land and splash down. So, we've collected a bit of science, and it's uh, now time to do it all again. So our total science haul is 31.9 from that trip. Not great seeing as we lost the science junior, but it's enough. We've recovered a bit of money from the remains of the vehicle and Jeb leveled up too and got his first unique accolade ribbon for being the first to orbit Kerbin. And here we can see the stage recovery in action with one of the boosters recovered and a parachute on its own for some reason. We also recovered the core stage too, but lost the fuel tank and engine during re-entry, so we end up recovering about 4,000 credits here, plus another 1,000 from the returned craft. We'll upgrade the astronaut complex so we can perform EVAs, and now it's time to spend our science points. We're going to get advanced rocketry so we can get the larger fuel tank, meaning we can free up our part limit, and also the efficient upper stage engine, the Terrier. And seeing as we've completed our mission to orbit Kerbin, we need to get another contract to make some money. And as we've upgraded mission control earlier, we can accept up to seven contracts now. So sure, we'll take that MUN contract, and we'll also send some probes to it ahead of us. You'll notice a lot of different contracts in this list, and that's a mod called Contract Configurator, which allows the addition of new contracts and categories. I've got seven contract packs added, but the main ones you're seeing here are Exploration Plus, which overhauls the stock exploration contracts, and unmanned contracts for probes. So we'll take that orbital probe contract and we'll pick up the return contract once we're in orbit and can fit it into our log. We'll also grab some quick part contracts that can be done at the launch site so we can earn a quick buck or two. So we're back to the VAB and let's send up Plunk 4 to grab a bucket load of signs. Now, some minor changes, we are swapping over those smaller T200 tanks for the new T400s, giving ourselves a bit more Delta V and reducing our part count because we don't need as many tanks to make up the same space. We're moving much of the signs onto the command pods outside so we can keep that upper stage the same length and we're swapping the swivel engine out on that stage for the Terrier for use in space. We're also going to swap the swivel engine on the core stage for the more powerful Reliance and adding some winglets to the SRBs to give the gimbal a little bit more authority. This brings us up to a healthy 5200 meters a second of Delta V, provided we can use the Terrier engine only once we're in space, which is very doable considering we've got almost 3000 meters a second before we actually get to separation. Over to the launch pad, and I did say we were going to brute force this one, and that apparently means not checking my staging. It's all good though, we'll move those Terrier engines out of the parachute stages during the flight. We're doing our Science Junior early to get that ascent data, as there'll be plenty of chances to get orbital information later. As we approach separation, we already have enough height to reach space, so we're going to conserve some Delta V as we spin around a little bit. This was partially due to the lack of a reaction control system on the now larger rocket and changing the engine to one that does not gimbal. So we'll get back onto our heading and gradually bring the throttle back up as we stabilize it. Our pilot today is Val and as the first Kerbal to reach space, she's received a lot of attention after her successful mission. And now the mailroom has to find a new location to store all the fan mail she's getting. And during that, we've completed our upper stage separation, and we're going to do a quick burn to push out our orbital period so we can properly burn at the apoapsis and make the most of the fuel we have on board. 
and Val is getting a big science gathering operation underway, performing multiple EVAs to collect observation data for the boffins back at the KSC, and we'll say test out elements of the pressure suit for future launches. I mean, not really, but it's what NASA would do. Now that we've circularized our orbit, we're getting information about our stage recovery. And we've managed to recover 2,000 credits each for each of those boosters and 1,700 for that core stage. Over the course of this mission, Val is going to conduct seven EVAs, including one that qualifies for the very dangerous EVA ribbon in Final Frontier. That's the mod which awards military-style ribbons to Kerbals based on a number of tasks. As we collect the last drips of science we can from our current hardware, we'll take a moment to get some beauty shots for the video cover because there's nothing better from a PR point of view than pictures. It's part of the reason the Hubble became such a successful mission in the eyes of the public, because NASA would release images of what it was doing, even if they are sometimes composite images or extrapolated from data. So with that taken care of, Val has strapped in for our re-entry burn over the deserts, this trajectory should have us splash down just off the west coast of the KSC Peninsula. And this time, thanks to our abundance of fuel and power storage, it is a much more controlled re-entry. Slowing down our orbital velocity enough to prevent overheating while still flying in with a ballistic profile. Going forward, we'll be trying to land as close to the KSC as possible to maximise our recovery of funds. But at this early stage of the program, getting home in one piece is much more important. And as you can see with our tumbling re-entry, it's a little bit hard to control it with this limited level of technology unless you go for a traditional individual capsule with just a heat shield on the back. So obviously a little bit of advancements need to be done so that we can land how we want to and recover as much as we want. But all in all, I'd say that's a pretty successful mission. We've managed to scoop up 48 science points this mission, and we've also recovered 5,300 credits from our command pod, bringing our total recovered funds to 11,000. Val has also leveled up to level one and collected a few new ribbons, including the first Kerbin EVA, first EVA in space, and a dangerous EVA ribbon. So it's time to hop over to the lab one more time this video, and we've got 133 science to spend, and electricals is the big one for our upcoming missions. It has probe cores and solar panels within it, which are gonna be critical for our upcoming probe blitz. And this mission brings to an end what I'm dubbing the Plunk Program, where we've pushed the limits of Kerbal Kind to new frontiers and helped our little green space agency understand that space is indeed hard but not impossible. The next mission will be focused on using probes to gather some well-needed cash reserves before we start our big push to the MUN. And there's also an Artemis 3 video I'm working on as well, which will be the follow-up to the MUN gateway video from last week. So until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next pass.